begin our service this morning with a reading from the book of Psalms. Mizmor le David Adonai mi agur ba'o halecha mi yishkon b'har kodshecha. Olek tamim ufoel tzedek v'dover emet bilvavo. Lo ragal alishono lo asa le re'ehu ra'a v'cherpa lo nasa al krovo. Nivzebe nav nimas v'et yirei Adonai yichabed nishba le'ara v'lo yamir. Kaspo lo natan v'neshech v'shochad al maki lo lakach. Ose ele lo yimot le'olam v'ed. O Lord, who shall dwell in your sanctuary? Who shall abide upon your holy mountain? He who lived with integrity, did what was right and spoke the truth in his heart, who had no slander upon his tongue, who did no evil to his fellow, who did not reproach his neighbor. In his eyes, a vile person is despised, but he honors those who revere the Lord. He does not take advantage of the poor, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall stand firm forever. And now from the writings of Ben Sira, reflections on life and when life comes to an end. Fear not death, we are destined to die. We share it with all who ever lived, with all who ever will be. Be well the dead, hide not your grief, do not restrain your mourning. But remember that continuing sorrow is worse than death. When the dead are at rest, let their memory rest and be consoled when the soul departs. Death is better than a life of pain and eternal rest than constant sickness. Seek not to understand what is too difficult for you. Search not for what is hidden from you. Be not overoccupied with what is beyond you, for you have been shown more than you can understand. As a drop of water in the sea, as a grain of sand on the shore, are our few days in eternity. The good things in life last for limited days, but a good name endures forever. O God, our heavenly parent, you redeem our souls from the grave. You are the rock of our salvation. Forsake us not in time of trouble and days of distress and desolation. Help us to endure, O Lord, for we have placed our hope in you. And we'll recite the 23rd Psalm. If you know the words, please feel free to join with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This morning we'll begin with some Remarks and remembrances from Harvey Jacob's children. We'll call first on John and then Natalie and then Robert. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you all for coming. Um, I actually thought I was going to talk after you, so I, I uh, could say you already said such and such. Um, but uh, I tried to keep it brief. Only one page, but, it'll, but I'll speak slowly because I cannot read my handwriting very well. Um, I think we all know about my father's sense of humor, his ability to find the humor in many situations, his puns, and his catchphrases. He was a skillful magician, too. One of his favorite stories, he he had great sleight of hand. He would entertain the grandchildren, the kids, whenever he saw them. And one of his favorite stories was about the magician who walked down the street and turned into a drugstore. This is a sad occasion because we all have such sweet memories of him. I think of him and I try to think 
how he would talk about these feelings. I can only think of one of his favorite catchphrases, not about the magician, but the rabbit in the hat. Here today, gone to, hair today, hair today, gone tomorrow. Sorry. I was expecting you all to say it, so. <laughs> uh, I, had, uh, I had my today with him, and I have to remember what I learned from him in that today now that tomorrow's here. Our father liked to take things apart so that he could put them back together sometimes and that he could learn how they worked. He was always interested in learning new things, doing new things. He had a teaching degree from Ohio State, but he didn't lecture us. He didn't usually tell you what to do, and what I learned from him was mostly by example or just from a brief statement. When I was a little kid, five or six or seven years old, my father would get up every morning to go to work. He would kiss my mother goodbye and say, I love you. And I was kind of a wise guy as a little kid. Uh, so I asked him, why do you have to tell her that every day? She already knows. He said, because I don't want her to forget. I thought a long time about, about that, about how many of his actions are about reinforcing things and the important part, reinforcing the important stuff. He was very concerned about making other people happy because he knew that that was the way to make himself happy. And he generally did let others have their way, you know, and when, when you're a kid, you don't believe that because he never let you have your way. But when, it, but when it was important to him, he did get his way. He was quiet, but not passive. He was modest. Often he didn't say much and he spoke much less as he got older. But, and sometimes people like that can seem a bit aloof, but he didn't. He was charming. Everyone who has talked to us about him has said what a great guy he was, how friendly, how easygoing, and so on, and, and that he listened to them. He always said, well, I'm not loquacious. He particularly liked that word, but as my son Simon pointed out, he wasn't really that quiet. He knew how not to talk over people. He knew when and how to listen to them. Probably the most important thing. And I'm, I'm still waiting on learning that. Um, but uh, when, when he met my wife, Joy, before we were married, when he first met her, he didn't give his opinion. All he said was, Koletsky, we don't know any Koletskys, but he did make his he did make his opinion known. Now, I was the last of the three of us to marry, and this was his last shot at an in-law, at, at a at a daughter or son-in-law. Um, and he took out uh, my mother's engagement ring, and he gave it to me. He said, just in case. So. I knew what his opinion was, but he didn't have to tell me. Anyway, um, I was going to finish with the line about hair today, gone tomorrow, but I didn't think that was good. That was a good finish. Um, just, uh, I guess I, I was thinking of great lines from, from books. You know, some author, authors often try to come up with a big finish, and there's really only one that I remember. And it's about the importance of memory and uh, how memory shapes you. And it's, it's a little bit negative because it's really about how memory can, how being confined to your memories can hurt you. But it's, it's also about how your, the people, the examples that you, you see and the memories of those people are the things that, that create, your, create you, that build you, that, that make you, and that you need to stay true to after they're gone. It's the last line from The Great Gatsby. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Thank you. Um, I think my sister Natalie is going to speak next. Let me just get this thing out of here.
this is this is going to be short. So I'm going to wear my glasses. So I was thinking about dad, and it struck me that the quality of dad, which probably shaped me the most, was his sense of craft. And I think about that. You know, I'm an architect. I think about that a lot. And maybe that was how he guided me to what, you know, actually was the most perfect life for me, but which neither of us knew anything about at the time when I first started in on this path. But when I talk about craft, I talk about my dad. He was a craftsman, and a craftsman of woodworking, of gardening, of even computering, if there's such a word, because, you know, he cared to make things right. That's the sense. No matter what he was doing, he worked his hardest to make them right. He was patient. He was forgiving. He was thorough. But he was inventive, and he was creative. He was quick to understand stuff. He could understand. He could see patterns. He could see a path. He could see a solution. He puzzled through all kinds of things. We would get lost driving somewhere. It wasn't a setback. It was an adventure. We'd see new things. We'd suss out our way. We'd puzzle it out. We'd get there, and it would be fun. He saw patterns, and he was really intuitive. He loved to figure out everything. He, starting from the Sudoku and the word, word, word jumble in the plain dealer in the morning, then like how to make the best decision at a blackjack table in Las Vegas or Niagara Falls. He loved to see Shakespearean plays in Ontario. He took us when we first moved to Cleveland to see our first plays when we were teenagers. And then he kept going year after year with Sandra. He loved to play bridge. He was really good at bridge. Um, he loved to play Scrabble. We played gin a lot. He was still beating me and Alana at gin when we played with him this December. And of course, you know about his putting and his magic tricks. I don't even have to tell you because those are just the best of them. But all the time I knew him, he never hectored, he never nagged, he never made up a million difficult rules to follow. We figured it out, we figured it out together, but he was, he was the, an amazing example. He was kind, he was generous, he was super dependable, he was always there when I needed him. He came from Cleveland to my uh, final crit in architecture school. He was the only parent there. He was a little bit out of his element, but, um, but he came, and he did everything. He lived his life. He was never greedy for everything, but he did everything. He was just so satisfied just to be alive. He loved his family, and we loved him back so much, and I thank him for, for everything, and um, I just so miss him and my mom, like, forever. I would do this for Bob. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Harvey's youngest son, Robert, and um like all of us, just overcome by this. Um, I'm just going to talk about one thing about our dad, which I've thought a lot about in retrospect and during the last two days, which was all the world knew that he loved puns and loved punning. And we've heard many, many of them. And I've asked myself, why did he love punning so much? What was behind all this? And my thoughts on this are, our dad was a very, very bright, very smart, very intelligent man, but at the same time, very humble about it, about it all, about his accomplishments, about what he was able to do. Really the humblest of men, yet one of the brightest people you would ever just have the opportunity to meet. And out of his son, what was he, why was he punning so much? I would wonder about that sometimes. And he was the type of person who would always be teaching you whether you realized it or not. He would not be the type of person who would tell you things directly or hit you over the head with facts or figures or prescriptive ways that you should be doing something the way he thought was the right way. His motivation more was trying to get you to think for yourself and understand things and maybe look at them in a different sort of way. You know, with his passing, I'm thinking, what from his life could we bring into ourselves 
and carry with us for the rest of our lives. And this is perhaps the greatest gift is him telling us not directly, but by forcing us to think about things, sometimes through a joke about the truth or maybe the depth of a different way of looking at a problem in your life. They might seem trivial. For example, everybody tells their kids, don't be so concerned about surface appearances. Look beyond the surface. Try to understand the person or the situation. He would not tell us any of these things. Instead, he'd make a little joke about it. He might say something, well, you know, you're looking good, but are you good looking? <laughs> yeah. So I might look at something in a good way. I might look at it, the, the depth of it, right? He wanted to get beyond just the surface of it. He was a humble person who was not going to brag about his accomplishments. He felt that almost everybody's accomplishments were equally valid, right? He wouldn't give us a long lecture on this, though. He'd say, this person, he's great. He's just like a farmer. He's outstanding in his field. <laughs> you know? So he was telling us about the equality of people's accomplishments. It was so much more effective telling it a joke, telling it a pun, really trying to make us think for ourselves and think on our own instead of prescriptively telling us what to do, how to think. And he was a great teacher. I think that was his first love, was really being a teacher. And he kept going with that. And he was just excellent with that as a father. And for that, we will always be grateful to have known him and to be his children. And we will miss him forever. And we're very, very sad to see him go. And we've been dreading this day forever. And I'm sorry it had to happen. But thank you all for being here and sharing this moment with us. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you for your beautiful remarks and, uh, and for the wonderful stories that you've shared over the last couple of days as well. The great 20th century rabbi and philosopher Abraham Joshua Heschel noted that Judaism is a religion of time. We focus on time and sanctified over people and places and things. We pay attention to its passage and mark milestones and cycles in nature. Today is Rosh Chodesh Adar Rishon, a celebration of the new moon, the first of two Adars, which are observed during this Hebrew leap year. The beginning of a new month in ancient times was, as today, seen as a time for celebration, and this has repercussions for our observances today. As we bid a final farewell to Harvey Jacobs, we're asked to make note of this celebration of Rosh Chodesh by changing some of the prayers and psalms that are recited. The ancient rabbis further decreed that the joy of the people Israel outweighed the personal sadness of a family, and as such, no eulogies were to be given on this day. In order to respect the teaching of the rabbis, my remarks this morning will not be a eulogy, but rather a teaching. And I would like to focus on this coming week's Torah portion, Truma. Parshat Truma consists mostly of the instructions for the building of the tabernacle, the traveling place of worship to be used by the Israelites during their wanderings in the wilderness. The specifications laid out in the verses are quite specific with many details, allowing for a great deal of participation by the people in its completion. God tells Moses in Exodus 25-2 that the materials, even though they were in the wilderness, there would be materials and they would be given by those whose hearts so moved them. It seems to me more than a coincidence that this verse would be found in the Torah portion immediately following the passing of Harvey Jacobs. He was a man whose heart so moved him in many ways to help those around him. He was a giving and generous man, and an examination of his life bears this out. Harvey was born to Henry and Celia Jacobs on August 10, 1928. He was a brother to Louis of blessed memory and Lil. 
He grew up in Cleveland in a close-knit family. He had a close relationship with his older brother. Both were athletic and would frequently play sports together. He shared a special connection with Lil as well. She taught him to dance, and they would often dance while listening to records. When they were teens, it was the style for girls to wear their brother's white shirts along with a poodle skirt and bobby socks. Lil didn't have the white shirt, so she borrowed Harvey's. Uh, and when he needed the shirt, he went looking for her, and uh, a chase around the house ensued, and finally circling around the table, almost like from an old comedy scene, until he finally got the shirt. As you've heard, as a kid, Harvey loved sleight of hand and magic. He taught himself tricks and illusions and enjoyed entertaining others, which was something that he shared with his kids and even grandkids later in life. Harvey was a joiner. He was a Boy Scout life member and an Eagle Scout. He was also active in AZA. During these years, he made friendships that lasted a lifetime. He even rekindled a relationship with a fellow student, Dr. Noodleman, while they were at Stone Gardens. At the same time, he also had part-time jobs such as selling peanuts at Geauga Lake, working in an Army-Navy store downtown, or selling shoes. Harvey was the first in the family to go off to college, and it was really something that he made happen for himself. Education was not a huge priority for his parents. His father expected his kids to work as he had. Harvey enrolled at The Ohio State University and began studying education. He continued to work a couple of jobs selling shoes and was also in the reserves at OSU. He made trips back and forth to Cleveland from Columbus to see his family. A story is told that he also used to send his laundry up to his mother and that she would return it all clean with a salami hidden amongst the clothes, a salami that Harvey would then hang in his closet at school, which I'm sure made him very popular, or not, with his roommates. One year at Passover, Harvey headed up to Cleveland for the Seder, but it was one of those Passovers when it was very snowy. He was delayed and delayed, and so his father decided to start the Seder without his son. It turned out that Harvey's car was involved in an accident and he had to hitchhike the rest of the way home. The family tells that his father was so annoyed that Harvey wasn't there. But when it came time to open the door for Elijah, it was not the prophet standing at the door, but Harvey himself. After receiving his degree in education, Harvey decided that what he really wanted to study was chemistry. He had to take some prerequisites to get into the graduate program, but he eventually completed his studies with a PhD. This is a great source of pride for many in the family. Harvey went on to hold a variety of jobs in the field of chemistry, in particular in toxicology. At various times he worked at the Poison Center with a special, home install, a special phone installed at the house to take emergency calls and in the coroner's office. Harvey's accomplishments in his field were many, although he was, as we heard, quite humble and tended to downplay them. He was well-liked by those with whom he worked, preferring to be called Harvey rather than Dr. Jacobs. Harvey had many interests and talents. He was a fun guy. He loved music and dancing. He had a great sense of humor and was quick with a witty comeback. He rarely met a pun that he did not like. Harvey was always sharing jokes, some of which I would get secondhand from his brother-in-law, Marty, he was quite handy. He defied the Jewish male stereotype by building a fence, constructing a closet, and finishing the basement at the home, at the family home. As Natalie mentioned, he had a sense of craft and took meticulous care in the work that he did. Harvey had great curiosity, would take things apart, put them together again, or repurpose them, like an old vacuum cleaner that he adapted to clean his workshop. He was quite a reader and even kept on up on the latest issues of chemical and engineering news, which I always saw on the table when I would visit him. He and Sandra hosted a short story group at Beth Elba Heights Synagogue, uh, and later in life he renewed his interest in football and watching sports on TV. Harvey's life, of course, was not just about these biographical facts, his childhood and academics and career and interest. His family was central to him. 
He met and fell in love with his first wife, Zelda of Blessed Memory. They began their lives together in Philadelphia and welcomed Jonathan, Natalie, and Robert into their growing family. During this time, they would travel back to Ohio for vacations. They wouldn't go to exotic places, but rather spent spending time with family was most important. And other times, the Cleveland family would travel out to Philly. Sadly, Zelda passed away when the children were still in elementary school. This was a difficult time for Harvey, being left with three young children. After various ups and downs, the family in Cleveland convinced him to move back from Philadelphia, where he had been working. In Ohio, relatives could help Harvey with the kids, and he could be there to care for his mother, who was aging and in need of some assistance herself. And so the family moved to Cleveland in 1972. After their arrival, Harvey joined a Jewish singles group. He met Sandra, and on their first date, they went dancing. Sandra used to say that she knew from that very night that it was meant to be. She could have danced all night. And it was, in fact, that song from The King and I that Harvey often requested in her honor. They built a wonderful life for themselves and were together until her passing in 2017. Harvey's children grew up, found partners, and began their own families. He was so very proud of his children with whom he spoke all the time and absolutely loved his grandchildren. He enjoyed, as we heard, doing woodworking projects with them as well as magic tricks. In his later years, he continued to be close to his siblings. After retirement, Harvey often assisted Louie in his locksmith business. There was nothing that Harvey would not do for others in need. As I mentioned earlier, this is reflective of the verse in this coming week's Torah portion, Truma. Harvey was a generous person who gave so much of himself to others. In the short time that I had gotten to know him, I was able to see his kind and giving spirit as well. And this is a sentiment that has come up over and again in discussions with congregants over the last few days and in emails that I have received about him. He was so very beloved. Because his heart so moved him, he moved the hearts of those around him. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, today is Rosh Chodesh. For the Jewish people, it is a time of joy, even, even as it is a time of grief and sadness for us at this moment. The rabbis bid us not to eulogize, but it's impossible not to honor this sweet, kind, humble, and generous man. May our reflections on his life, along with our own memories, continue to move our hearts. May we be inspired by Harvey to live out the ideals that were so important to him. In doing so, we help to ensure that his soul will be bound up in the bonds of eternal life. On behalf of everyone at Bethel, the Heights Synagogue, and everyone in the community and family and friends, we wish our condolences to Jonathan and Joy, to Natalie and Mark, to Robert and Trudy, to Michael, Gary and Catherine, Alex, Judith and Dominique, to the grandchildren, four great-grandchildren, to sibling, siblings, to Lillian and Marty, and to the rest of the family, we wish you. May you be comforted together with all others among our people who are in mourning. And we say, Amen. We're going to continue now with the recitation of the El Malay Rachamim prayer. It's actually the Elo Haslichot prayer because it is Rosh Chodesh, the typical memorial prayer that we recite, is switched out. I will ask all those who are able to please rise for the Elo Haslichot prayer. Elo Haslichot, Hanun Verachum, Erecha Paim Brav Chesed, Hamsecha Prat Pesha. The Hakravat Yesham Nuchan Nechona Tahat Kanfe Hashina Bemalot Kedoshimo Teorim Kizorakia Mazirim 
את נשמת אברהם בן חיים וצביה שלח לעולמו. אנא בעל הרחמים, זכרו לו לטובה כל זכויותיו וצדקותיו בארצות החיים. ובטח לו שערי צדק ואורה, שערי חמלה וחנינה. בסתר כנפיך הסתירהו לעולמים. וצרור בצרור החיים את נשמתו, אדוני הוא נחלתו. וינוח בשלום על משכבו, ונאמר אמן. O God of forgiveness, who is compassionate and gracious and patient and full of loving kindness, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of Harvey Jacobs, who has gone to his eternal home. Master of mercy, we beseech you, remember all the worthy and righteous deeds that he performed in the land of the living. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. The Lord is his portion. May he rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you.